Mars gotta go take it. Yeah, Woo. yeah, Woo. yeah. No, I'm not finished, just start it. No, I'm not told me go mind you. Feel like my Vic with the option. Yeah. Y'all saying blitz, I'm getting out the pocket. Y'all saying blitz, I'm <clears throat> All right. Well, wow. All right. Good morning and welcome to our last day of Spiritual Emphasis Week. <laughs> Guys, I'm crying up here. That was not a moment to clap. I'm very sad about this, all right? But it's okay. It's our last day. Um, God has been showing us some amazing things through his word this week. I'm super excited about what um, he's going to talk to us about today. Um, let's go ahead and pray. And let's get started. Father, I thank you for um, all of the wonderful things that you do for us each and every day. And, and I start every prayer like that. And God, I do want to be thankful, but I don't want it to just be repetitive. God, you're great, and we're thankful. Um, I just pray that today you would speak to us, continue to speak to us through your word, that, uh, that through worship you would um, fill us with your spirit, that we would go out of this place completely changed um, and ready to do whatever it takes to bring you the most honor and glory from each of our individual lives and as a school. And so we thank you. We love you. It's in your name. Amen. All right, you guys can go ahead and stand up for worship. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us, calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're hearing, I know you are moving. I'm hearing, I know you will feel me calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're hearing, I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us as the Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us, fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us, come rest on us, calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're hearing, I know you are moving. I'm hearing, I know you will feel me calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're hearing, I know you are moving. I'm hearing, I know you will feel me. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. 
Calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're hearing. I know you are moving. I'm hearing. I know you will feel me. Calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're hearing. I know you are moving. I'm hearing. I know you will feel me. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for gathering us here together this whole week to learn from your word. We pray, Father, that you would be with us in this time to be attentive. Um, help us to um, learn from your word. Um, and I pray, Father, that this song would be um, a song that we sing uh, constantly. Um, not necessarily the, the specific words, um, but the, this concept of your Holy Spirit, that it would fill our lives and that it would, um, it would just, your spirit would walk with us wherever we go. We pray, pray Father, that we would not live our lives as if um, your spirit is not with us. We ask this, Father, in you we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. Um, our speaker this morning is one that is very familiar to all of you. As he introduced me yesterday, um, I'll, I'll give him a similar introduction, all right? He is a man of God. He is a man of valor. He is a man of faith. Um, he, uh, in all seriousness, though, he's heavily involved at Marywood Christian Camp. He's involved here at our school now and in our church. He does a lot of things behind the scenes that you don't always see, um, but he's, he, he's doing work for all three of those ministries. And so, please, give a warm SBCS welcome to the one and only Mr. Henley. All right. Am I on? It's so disorienting. You think that I, I hear the I hear the microphone barely, but I mainly just hear myself talking, and I can't hear myself from your perspective. Does that make? All right. So here's the thing. Uh, I don't speak a lot, um, and what I mean by that is uh, I teach in the classroom, obviously, and a lot of that is conversational, and uh, a lot of that you can. There's a lot of discussion in that, um, and I can somewhat improvise some of that stuff, but this stuff like. I have to really practice a lot of what I, I speak. Um, Mr. Kleiner, last year in the youth group here at Salem, uh, he asked me to lead a whole youth series, and I had never done anything like that before, and I only have that one series under my belt. So uh, I have to practice this a lot more, so this is a really big learning opportunity, and I'm really uh, glad that, um, and it's a privilege to be asked by Mr. McNeil to, to speak today. And by the way, as some of you guys in my class know, I have a, I have a problem burping whenever I speak. So Ms. Uh, Ms. Carter, I, I am sorry in advance about any uh, burping that I do in this message. So just, just a heads up, okay? Oh, that splashed right in my face. This is so awkward. <laughs> All right, so um, let's, uh, because I need, to, uh, I need the Lord's help in speaking, because uh, it's not my natural ability to do it like this, um, let's go to the word in prayer and uh, let's, uh, let's dive in. God, I uh, thank you so much for gathering us here together. Um, I pray that you would please be with me. Um, help me to uh, remember everything that I've practiced and to um, teach well uh, what your word says. Um, and God, I know that I'm going to step on a lot of toes today when it comes to what we're talking about. Um, and Father, I ask that you would just help us all to have um, open ears and open hearts for what needs to be um, said today. And that nothing um, from the message today would necessarily be um, from me necessarily, but it would just be from your word. And I pray, Father, that people would remember um, what you have said in your word um, more than what I have said um, in, in my transcript. Um, I pray, Father, that you would please be with us in this time. I ask this name we pray. Amen. All right, so it works. The message today uh, is called The Unsaved Christian. It's based on a book. Um, now, I did not read this entire book in order to deliver this message. Um, I did pull some stuff from that book to, to, as a resource. Um, but The Unsaved Christian is uh, a commentary on something that has been on my heart for a while. And some of you guys may be familiar with the term, but it's called uh, cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity. And I'm going to explain kind of what that means. But um, you might he see that, like, isn't that a, an oxymoron? Uh, what is an, doesn't, to be a Christian, doesn't that mean to be saved? Um, and you're right, it does. And it is an oxymoron. Um, but that's why it's a, it's a, it's a term, it's a, it's a kind of a, it's an oxymoron to help 
describe what cultural Christianity is. Um, and to kind of illustrate this, um, some of you guys in my Bible doctors class have seen a lot of these photos, um, but this, is, uh, this was my childhood, all right? Um, some of my high school years. So as you can see there, uh, is this laser work? Does the laser work? It does. Okay, there we go. That's me right there in my uh, Awana uniform. Uh, anyone ever done Awanas or heard of Awanas? There we go. Just memory verses, like you just complete those. Um, right there is me in my Bible man costume. It was some youth retreat, and it was like a superhero spirit night, and I was obviously the only one with a Bible man costume. Um, and then right there, um, many of the teachers in here uh, probably remember this kid. Um, this kid uh, was uh, a big Liberty University fanatic. Um, I was super into Liberty University. I really, I, I think from middle school on, like I, that was my identity. Uh, my identity from middle school and on was uh, Marvel and the Marvel movies. And it was, uh, it was the uh, Liberty University merch, all of that stuff. In fact, um, Ms. Campbell, do you remember those sunglasses that I would wear all the time on my head? Um, I don't know if you remember, but I wore like, these red sunglasses on my head to the point, Mr. Mr. Michael remembers, uh, to the point where like they were, the, the nose pieces on those plastic sunglasses were like embedded in my head. And there was like an indention uh, on, my, on my head because of how long I wore those things. Um, they were on my head way longer and way more than they were on my face. Don't even think they were polarized. Um, so I probably have less good vision than uh, before. But um, these, uh, all this kind of bottom section here, um, so this is kind of like all the, so these three right here are the different concerts I've been to. I've been to a lot of Christian concerts. Um, that right there is just kind of to show that uh, I was uh, involved in a lot of different worship teams. Um, even though I play piano and guitar, my first real instrument was the drums. Um, and the reason I got into drums is because uh, you guys are familiar with the band Skillet, the Christian rock band. Um, at, in middle school and part of high school, that was my favorite band was Skillet. And uh, their drummer is a girl. And I had a huge crush in middle school on the drummer for Skillet. And so that motivated me to want to learn the drums myself. And uh, if I'm honest, if, if, even though my dad had a big part in getting me those music lessons and helping me in my music journey, um, I can attribute a lot of my musical, where I'm at now musically, due to the crush that I had on the drummer from Skillet in middle school. Um, but uh, that was right there is the uh, Dixie Classic Fair uh, where Colton Dixon was there. Um, that's Danny Gokey at my old church where he performed. And then, uh, which I don't listen to really either of those guys anymore. I didn't really even back then. I just loved going to concerts. Um, and then that group right there, that was at Liberty, um, their Winterfest. And uh, that's a band called We As Human, who Skillet discovered. And uh, that guy on the left, um, they're not a band anymore because that guy decided to have uh, an affair. Um, so that, was, that doesn't go well in the Christian music industry. So uh, they're not a band anymore. So that's awkward. Um, but I say that, I say that to say, uh, I was very involved in Christian culture. Um, my, my favorite, uh, th my main form of entertainment was uh, Veggie Tales, uh, 321 Penguins, obviously Bible Man. Um, the Left Behind movies, and uh, I saw a lot of movies in theaters like God's Not Dead, uh, Son of God, Do You Believe, Heaven is For Real, and I genuinely preferred the Christian alternatives to all the mainstream uh, music that we listen to today. Um, I just genuinely thought it was better. And uh, even my, my sixth birthday party was Bible Man themed. Um, and so this stuff, like all these things, like I grew up like the typical Christian kid. Um, and uh, you might be wondering, uh, why, are you, why are you bringing all this up? Um, well, the thing is, there's nothing wrong with the Christian things. There's nothing wrong with preferring Christian music to mainstream music. There's nothing wrong with watching Christian movies, even though they're mostly bad all the time. Um, but the thing is, um, those things are great, but it doesn't really, there's nothing wrong with them if it leads to gospel belief and practice. Um, and here's the problem with cultural Christianity, what, what I kind of fell into. Cultural Christianity admires Jesus, but doesn't really think he's needed, uh, except for moments to, to take the wheel, like, uh, like Carrie Underwood says. Um, Christ Christianity or, uh, cultural Christianity admires Jesus, but doesn't really think he's needed, except to take the wheel in moments of crisis. Um, and the Jesus of cultural Christianity is a type of historical imaginary friend 
with some magic powers for good luck and sentimentality. Um, there's familiarity with the church and Christian lingo, but a fami familiarity with the gospel is hard to find. Um, and to, to kind of go further with my stories, again, a lot of you guys in my Bible doctrines class know my testimony, um, but after I got baptized, uh, after my sixth birthday party, um, I was given a gift from my dad. It was a one-year Bible. Basically, it just takes you through the Bible in a, in a whole year. And uh, I read that thing a good bit, but around middle school, I fell off of it because uh, it got to a point where I was looking at the page and like, it was just white noise in my brain uh, when, I, when I opened it, like when I got to page two of whatever I was reading. Um, and it became monotonous and tedious, and uh, I, kinda, it, I just got unmotivated to read the Bible. And my parents throughout that whole time, going from middle school and into high school, they were pushing me and pressing me to, to keep pursuing God, to keep um, active in my Bible study. And the, looking back, I wanted to, to be a Christian um, but I didn't feel like I, I didn't want to feel like I had to do the Christian things. Um, I wanted the Christian lifestyle to come naturally and easily and not to have to work for it. Um, and that's just not what the Christian life is. And because uh, like I, I love going to youth group. Uh, my, my favorite, both youth groups that I've been a part of, I love my friends there. I love the, my youth pastors. Uh, and I loved going to the different events like uh, the, you know, summer retreat, summer camp, uh, all the different, you know, ministry opportunities we did. I loved doing those things, um, but those things aren't ultimately a relationship with Jesus. So when I got to college, uh, I tried out for a uh, student-led worship team, um, uh, and by the way, I went to, I didn't go to Liberty. I went to Gardner-Webb University, um, which is funny because, again, my personality was basically Liberty that whole time, and I visited both for like a, a college tour, and uh, I actually wound up liking Gardner Webb more, and so I, I chose that school, and everyone was blown away. Um, but I, I went into Gardner Webb um, thinking that I wanted to be a, a history teacher, and I got that first year of uh, teaching, like, I don't really want to be a teacher, and I also don't really care that much about history. And so I decided, what's the next best thing I can do? And that was music. And so I got a worship leadership degree, and here I am before you today, a Bible teacher, kind of a somewhat back where I started. Um, but I, I tried out for this worship team, and um, I've tried out for the drums, and uh, the audition went fairly well. There were some technical difficulties that weren't really in my control, and I got a letter in the mail uh, that week saying that I didn't make the team. And I was really confused because if it was about my performance, like I told you guys there were some technical difficulties, that shouldn't be my fault. So I wanted to talk to them, like, what, what was the reasoning for that? And they told me the audition for the drums went great. Uh, but this audition had two parts of it. There was the, can you play drums? Um, but also, um, there were some gospel-centered questions. And they kind of came to the conclusion as a, as a group of leaders that I didn't really have a good grasp of the gospel. I surprisingly took that really well. Uh, I didn't, like, get offended. Um, but it was really confusing to me because, uh, again, you guys saw my, you basically just, you see my childhood right there, uh, how I grew up. Um, but uh, when it came to the gospel, um, I kind of like that quote I just said, cultural Christianity uh, is familiar with church and Christian lingo, but a fami familiarity with the gospel is hard to find. So if you would have asked me, Josh, do you believe that you're a sinner? I would have said yes. Do you believe that God is holy? I would have said yes. Um, do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? I would have said yes. I would have said to all of the components of the gospel, but if you were to ask me what the gospel was, I would just tell you it means good news because that's what I remember from youth group. Um, but there was no, I couldn't really communicate what the gospel was. I couldn't, if someone were to come to me like, how do you get saved? Like, I don't know if I would have been really equipped to answer that. Um, so at that point in my life, the gospel was kind of numb to me. Um, and eventually in college, I, I had an identity crisis because I realized that I was putting, you know, my, my friendships, the people that I was uh, involved with, I, I was putting my identity in them and my validation in them rather than God. They were on the pedestal and God was not. Um, so I called my dad and he helped me get on the right path. And for the most part, I, I considered myself rededicated at that point. Um, but really in this past year, I've realized how much of this stuff um, has actually still, is still actually a part of my life. Um, and so whenever I talk about this concept of cultural Christianity, um, I'm not saying this from a judgmental part or part of my heart. Um, I'm saying this from sympathy and out of love for you guys who might be affected by this too. 
um, because there, I think there genuinely, possibly, could be a demon called Christ, or cultural Christianity that's affecting America today that um, we've got we've to rid ourselves of. So maybe I describe some of you guys, maybe your walk with God is just based on uh, a successful business model of religious entertainment. Um, that's not Christianity. Um, or maybe you were like a lot of students that I went to church with who um, the only reasons that, or maybe that some of you, or maybe that someone that you know, who the only reason they go to church is because their parents drive them, or because they live under the same roof, they're expected to go to church. But you know as soon as they either go off to college or they get their own place, um, the church is not going to be a priority for them anymore. And uh, Christianity, it'll be as if they were never saved at all. Um, and maybe you know some of those people. Um, so, I'm gonna to I'm gonna tell another story, but it's not about me. It's about uh, something that happened in the early 2000s. Um, in 2002, there was a youth evangelism conference in Montgomery, Alabama, and uh, there was a uh, I think one, probably the closing speaker. I think it was uh, his name was Paul Washer. He was a missionary. Um, he's still uh, active today. He's more famous now than he was back in 2002. Um, but uh, the message was called An Appeal to the Youth. But four years later, um, after the sermon was preached, uh, someone uploaded it to YouTube and just titled it um, Paul Washer, Shocking Message, um, the earliest form of clickbait uh, back in the day whenever YouTube was launched. Um, but uh, after he introduced himself, uh, he prayed, he read the passage of Scripture that we're going to read today, and uh, this is what he said. I stand here today and I'm not troubled in my heart about your self-esteem. I'm not troubled in my heart about whether or not you feel good about yourself or whether or not life is turning out the way you want it to turn out. There's only one thing that gave me a sleepless night. There's only one thing that troubled me all throughout the morning, and that is this. Within a hundred years, a great majority of people in this building will possibly be in hell. And again, this is a youth evangelism conference. And many who even profess Jesus Christ as Lord will spend an eternity in hell. You say, Pastor, how can you say such a thing? I can say such a thing because I don't do my Christian work in America. I spend most of my time preaching in South America, uh, in Africa, in Eastern Europe. And I want you to know that uh, when you take a look at American Christianity, it is based more upon a godless culture than it is upon the Word of God. And so many people are deceived, and so many youth are deceived, and so many adults are deceived into believing that because they prayed a prayer once in their lifetime, that they're going to heaven. And when they look around at others who profess to know Christ and see those people also as worldly as the world, and they compare themselves by themselves, nothing troubles their heart. They think, well, I'm the same as most people in my youth group. I watch things that I shouldn't watch on television. And I laugh about the very things that God hates. Uh, I wear clothing that is sensual. I, I talk like the world. I walk like the world. I love the music of the world. I love so much in the world, but bless God, I'm a Christian. Why am I a Christian? I don't look any differently than most people in my church. Why am I a Christian? Because there was a time in my life when I prayed a prayer and asked Jesus to come into my heart. And this is still Paul Washer talking. I want you to know that the greatest heresy in the American evangelical and Protestant church is that if you pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart, he will definitely come in. You will not find that in any place in scripture. You will not find that anywhere in Baptist history until about 50 years ago. What you need to know is that salvation is by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. And faith alone in Jesus Christ is preceded and followed by repentance, a turning away from sin, a hatred for the things that God hates, and a love for the things that God loves, growing, uh, growing in holiness and a desire not to be like Britney Spears, but to be like the world, and not to be like a great majority of American Christians, but to be like Jesus Christ. And in that moment, the entire audience was just clapping and cheering because of like, the, the amount of truths after truths after truths that Paul Washer was saying. And after the audience died down, Paul Washer says, I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. And then everyone in that audience and everyone watching that on YouTube years later, their stomachs dropped and they were like, wow, they had never been confronted like that before. Now, uh, you can either focus on how the Britney Spears reference really dates that sermon, um, or you can, uh, you can focus on what's being said there. And I want to, you know, take what he said and apply it to this building. There, might, or there are a great majority of self-identified Christians in this building that might possibly wind up in hell. And you might ask me the same question, like, Mr. Henley, what, 
you know, why, how can you say that? How can you say that someone who claims to be a Christian might be going to hell? Uh, that doesn't sound right at all. Well, let's read the passage that we're going to read to you today, and uh, we'll kind of go into this. So go in your Bibles to Matthew 7, 13 through, 13 through 27. Matthew 7, 13 through 27. <clears throat> There's going to be one passage that we focus on in this, but I'm going to read the, this entire section. Matthew 7, 13 through 27. It's on the screen. Here's what it says, and I'm reading from the ESV. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that, takes, that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard, and that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness." Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, uh, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who has built uh, his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against their house and it fell and, the gr and great was the fall of it. So that's from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' is, you know, the greatest sermon ever preached. And, um, and I don't know if you've already zoned out because you're like me and reading just makes you bored and you just can't focus for too long on one thing. Um, that's, I'm, I'm the same as you in that regard. Um, but this is what it says in, a, go back to verse 21 right there. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So what's being said there? Let's break it down. We're going to break down this uh, a couple of times, but this is what I want to kind of focus on. Uh, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, uh, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, the next verse says that there will be prophets and exorcists and miracle workers that claim the name of Jesus, and he will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. That should be scary because, I don't know, not all of us are prophets or exorcists or miracle workers, but we do a lot of things in the Christian life, or whether it be in, our, in this Christian school, or uh, whether we go to church, we'll do a lot of things and we'll claim the name of Jesus. But if we don't have Jesus in our heart and we do these great things, um, Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And that might be a lot of us in here. Now, I know that there's a lot of people that really struggle in their life with like, the assurance of their salvation. Um, I know that, uh, I don't know if you guys know uh, Austin Needham, but um, Austin Needham was uh, a mentor of mine when I was a, a kid. He's also spoken at Marywood a couple times. Um, and he, his testimony, he talks about um, how a good bit of his life was he struggled with this, this concept of the assurance of salvation. So he, he, he asked the Lord into his life so many different times in, in his life. And, um, and finally, he got that assurance. So I know that this is a struggle for a lot of you, and I'm not trying to scare you. Um, in fact, there might be something for you in this message that can give you hope and assurance. Um, and I'm also not going to give you a diagnosis without a cure. Um, and the cure is in this, uh, in this passage. So, but I, what, what I do want you guys to do, and what you guys, I want you guys to ask yourself is, am I right with God, and am I truly saved? Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail into this other story, but the book that this is based on, uh, The Unsaved Christian, um, the, uh, and I'm not going to, a lot of the, when I was putting this together, I did plan on reading this whole book and just paraphrasing it for you guys. Um, but a lot of the, what the, this passage is saying is what I want to focus on and uh, just use whatever I can from the book. But uh, 
the author of the book, Dean and Sarah, he, he has a friend named Matt, and uh, they are seminary buddies, and Matt is going to uh, California, and uh, Dean and Sarah, the author, is going back to the Bible Belt where, uh, he, where he lives. Um, and he made, the author made some sort of joke about, well, there you are going to the most secular state in the, in the country, uh, where, whereas I'm going to the Bible Belt. And uh, his friend says, whatever, man, the Bible Belt is the hardest place to pastor a local church. And the author's like, what do you mean by that? It's the Bible Belt. It's in the name, Bible Belt. And uh, he, he kind of clarifies. He says, um, there are a lot of people who believe in God, but do not believe that their sin has done anything to separate them from God or cause them to need Jesus, um, that they, the Jesus that they claim to believe in. It's almost like you have to get them lost before you can actually get them saved. Um, and I think that a lot of us in this room might, because we grew up in church and because we love the Christian things or whatever it may be, um, that might be us where we actually, if, if we're to truly get saved, we have to recognize that we're lost. A lot of us don't think that we're all that bad, and we think that we're pretty good Christians, um, but we're not. Um, I'm going to explain, uh, neither uh, Paul Washer, the author of this book, uh, recognized these two types of unsaved Christians. So these are, these are my kind of definitions of two types of cultural Christians. Um, but one I call the fanboy. Um, this was me. Uh, this is the person who's more concerned about the Christian things rather than pursuing a relationship with Christ himself. Um, it's almost like we substitute Christ for um, whatever, you know, whether it be worship music or uh, a movie or a Christian book or whatever it may be. Um, maybe it's even a pastor. Um, I remember, I mean, I'll be honest, I listened to a lot more sermons on YouTube back in the day than I did read my Bible. Um, and then, so a fanboy is, uh, is where I kind of struggle with. But there's also um, a lot of other people who I call the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries, these are uh, the person that wants the benefits of having good friends uh, and good morals, but has a failure to recognize their need for a savior. So they want to reap the benefits that Christianity and the culture has to offer rather than actually pursuing a relationship with Jesus. Both of these people uh, are people that claim to be Christians, but don't actually have a relationship with Christ. So ask yourself, what, which of those descriptions fits me best? Um, maybe neither describes you, and you're perfect, and you can just fall asleep the rest of chapel. Um, but uh, here's, a, here's what I want to do. I want to break down the, what, the passage that we just read, Matthew 7, 13 through uh, 24, and uh, let's read this. So, number one, in this passage it says, the narrow gate leads to life, verses 13 through 14. Says, enter by the way of the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. Uh, for the gate is or for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So what is it saying there? Um, it says that the 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 gate the gate of the world is wide. Um, it's really easy to get into. It does, it's it kind of promises this um, easy lifestyle that um, ultimately satisfies you. Um, and it's wide, and that means that it, because it's wide, it's going to be big, and everyone's going to be able to see it and find it. It's going to be really easy to go to it. Um, but it also says that it leads to destruction. Um, and destruction in this case means separation from God. Um, God is not in the, narrow, or the, the wide gate. He's, in the, he's on the narrow gate side, that path. Um, it also says at the end of 14 that very few find the narrow gate. Very few find the narrow gate. Um, that should be kind of scary. <laughs> that should be something that we hear and we're like, okay, maybe, maybe you need to ask yourself, am I on the path to, the, to God, the narrow gate? Am I pursuing a godly lifestyle or am I pursuing the things of this world? Um, and there might be something in the wide gate might, you know, there might be some of cultural Christianity in the wide gate that's telling you like, well, you can just do the, the right things um, and, and substitute Jesus for these things that are good in itself. Um, but here's, here's what Jesus says in John 14, 6. Um, no one gets to the Father but through me. No one gets to heaven but through Jesus Christ alone. And unless he is the center of our, and he's the foundation of our beliefs and our faith, then we're not going to heaven. If he's not, if we, if we just believe that he existed and that, like uh, that guy said, he's a, a, a historical imaginary friend that, um, 
gives us good luck in, in hard times. Um, that's, not, that's not the Christ of the Bible. That's not a Christ that can save. Next, bear good fruit. Um, we, th- th- we, can, we can read that passage again, or we can just you know, recognize that you know, good, the good tree produces good fruit. The bad tree produces bad fruit. The good tree is not going to produce bad fruit. The bad, tr- bad tree is not going to produce good fruit. Um, and it says that the bad tree is really only good for firewood. Um, it says that it's going to be thrown into the fire. Um, and that's kind of an analogy. That's a metaphor. Because these people that are bad trees that are producing bad fruit, um, they're, that, that's a metaphor for the judgment that they're going to face. Judgment by fire. And so, we have to, the thing that's hard about this passage, it, it kind of makes it seem like, okay, well, if I just, if I do the Christian things, if I, if I do, if I am producing good fruit, then like that means that I'm, that, I, that I'm saved by the things that I do. Um, that's not true either. Um, but the thing is, if we, if you look at your lifestyle and um, you're not rooted in Jesus, if, the, if you're a tree that's not rooted in Jesus, then you are going to produce bad fruit the good things that you do um, don't ultimately mean anything um, unless you have a relationship with Jesus. And then next, um, the one that we kind of focused on, not all who claim to be Christians are going to heaven. Um, Prophets, exorcists, miracle workers are not exempt. Um, This includes pastors or missionaries or um, Christian musicians or uh, Christian authors. I can't tell you how many times in the past I mean, we've, we've kind of entered a, an era of deconstruction where a lot of megachurch pastors uh, or uh, Christian artists who thought that they understood everything about what they believed are now leaving the faith because of things that are happening in our culture that they can't explain or um, things that they grew up believing weren't actually true. Um, and that's the purpose of the Bible doctrine classes that we have here. We want to we build a foundation for why we believe what we believe so you don't feel tricked or deceived whenever you grow up and go into the real world. Um, now, there are also other ways, and we see this in, in Scripture, there are other ways to, um, you know, have these gifts of, like, prophecy and um, e- exercising demons and doing these miracles, but unless it's from God, um, those, those ways are evil and wicked, and those do not come from God. So, um, a guy named Michael Wilkins, who, uh, he, he's, in one of the, he's one of the authors in the study Bible that I read, he says that Jesus warns that uh, a verbal confession uh, to God um, can mask an unrepented heart. So we can, we, we can put our faith in that prayer that we prayed once, um, whether it was uh, recited, that we, we just repeated back what the person said, or whether it was an organic prayer like, God, I just, I just pray that you would come into my life. Um, and it just, it just kind of ends there. Um, the prayer is not what saves you, and the prayer is not the action that follows. The prayer is not what produces the good fruit. We're not saved by the prayer, and they can mask an unrepented heart. Because in the end of verse 21, um, I lost it real quick, hold on. It says there, at the end, um, what does it say? It says, only those who actually do the will of my Father will enter heaven. So a lot of us will ask, like, what, is, what does it mean to be in the will of God? What is God's will for my life? And a lot of us will look all over the world and all over, like, go to all of these books and go to all these other people to try and figure out what God's will is in our life. But the thing is, God has spoken to you already. God has spoken to you on how to live a godly lifestyle, and that's in His Word. And a lot of us want to say that we are pursuing a godly lifestyle, but we really ne- we neglect to read our Bible because it's another book. And the thing is, this is God speaking to us. This is God revealing himself to us. And so the Bible is sufficient for all life and godliness. And everything that the Bible teaches can help us live a godly lifestyle. And if we want to know what God's will is in our life, if we're obeying God and if we're doing what God has commanded us and how to live, then it doesn't matter if you want to be a nurse or if you want to be uh, some sort of, I don't know, um, or a pastor or... uh, you know, start your own band, whatever it is. Like, if you're in the will of God, then if you're, if you're doing, if you're living a godly lifestyle and you're doing what he's commanded in scripture, then you can do any of those things if they honor God. And then the last thing is Christ and his teachings are our firm foundation. We've been singing this uh, 
in chapel the past couple of days. Um, Christ is our firm foundation, the rock on which we stand. Uh, the hymn that goes along with that is the, uh, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Um, that's, a, that's a great hymn to kind of teach us this truth. To walk in Christ is to walk in wisdom. Um, this is what verse 24 teaches. Um, if our lives are not rooted in Jesus, then all of the ground is sinking sand. Jesus is calling us to choose two different paths. We can either choose him or we can choose the religious establishment. Um, the Pharisees back in that day were calling for kind of a superficial, um, you know, face value lifestyle, uh, a religious system where all the things that you do are what gives you uh, peace and, and uh, assurance. Um, but Christ is calling you to something further. He's calling you um, to action and to, uh, to pursue something deeper than just how you look on the outside. So like a fool that builds his house on the sand, leaders like the Pharisees were calling for a surface level righteousness that's founded on flimsy hypocrisy. There's no actual heart change. So I'm gonna wrap this up in just a second. Um, so let's re revisit that statement about cultural Christianity. Um, it's like you have to get them lost to actually be saved. Um, sometimes we try to convince people that they are saved without really asking, um, r really figuring out if they are saved. We're trying to like, no, you're saved. You did all these things, like you're, you're good. But we're not really looking on a deeper level on if they are actually saved. What does the Bible say about their lifestyle? And I believe in perseverance of the saints, the once saved, always saved. But let's be honest, there are a lot of people who will use that to justify their sinful lifestyle. And that's why, and they feel like they're just fine the way they are. Um, but not everyone in the Christian life is a prodigal son. Um, a lot, like the prodigal son, like had a home to return to who he knew. Um, but a lot of people don't even know really who God is. They don't know who the owner of the house is or where the house is located. Um, and so not everyone is a prodigal son. Um, so find out who, that, who the father is. Find out who owns that house that you're supposed to return to. So this mindset that I prayed a prayer once um, can blind one to the call of salvation, repentance, and faith. So how can I know that I'm actually saved? We're about to wrap up. Um, what are the signs of true conversion? Uh, in Matthew uh, 13, uh, 19 through 23, um, you can flip there if you want. I'm going to flip there right now. But that's the, uh, that's the passage of the, uh, the parable of the sower. It says, uh, let's see here. Yeah. Uh, that same day, uh, out of the house, uh, Jesus sat beside the sea, and great uh, crowds uh, went about. Uh, in verse 19, that was, that was verse 1, I apologize. Verse 19, when anyone hears the words uh, of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. That, this is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. So the seed that's, that's thrown on the rock um, it, but it, it, you know, a seed can't grow roots in rock. So uh, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what uh, was sown among thorns, this is the one uh, who hears the word, but, and, but the cares of the world and uh, the deceitfulness of the world um, choke the word and, provide, and proves unfruitful. As for what is sown in the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. Um, so here's the thing. If you are hearing the word and understanding the word, if you're in the word, then you're going to produce fruit. If you are trying to pursue a godly lifestyle by being in his word and by praying to him, um, that's how you know that you have the true marks of a believer, is if you hear the word and you understand it, and then you apply it to your life. You're going to produce fruit if you do these things. So Here's the thing, I know that a lot of this was a lot of um, conviction, and, uh, but I hope that I've provided some enough scripture to show you that there is assurance to be had in um, if we're saved or not. Uh, so ask yourself these questions. If someone asked me how I know I'm a Christian, what would you say? Would you base it on the other people in your church? Or um, are you tempted to point to a specific arrangement? Uh, or are you tempted to uh, point to an emotional moment that you had? Or if you've trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, how does that calm your soul to know that you are purchased by the blood of Jesus and held by God alone? Um, guys, I love you, and I want us, I want us to strive for more. We're, we're striving for, uh, the theme this year is excellence, not perfection. Um, we're not going to be perfect. Um, even whenever you are saved, you're going to sin because we're humans. Um, that's just how it is. So what, what hope is there? 
Um, the hope is that whenever you are transformed by the Holy Spirit, the things that God hates, the sins that you do commit, um, you hate them and you hate doing them and you are convicted and you have this repentant heart and you confess those sins to God. Um, the, the unbeliever is not gonna do that. The unbeliever is gonna be perfectly fine doing the wrong thing and not desire anything less than what they're, what they're, sending, uh, what they're doing in their sin. Um, there, is, there is hope provided in the gospel. If we recognize that we are sinners and that God is holy and God requires perfection, but because we, don't, we can't get perfection, that's why he sent his perfect son to die in our place, the only one capable of taking on the sins of the world. Um, and if you believe that he is who he says he is and that he died for your sins and he rose again, um, then you will be saved. And if you pursue that lifestyle, you will produce the fruit that you want um, to produce. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. Um, we thank you for um, gathering us here together. Uh, I pray, Father, that what I've said is understood and that it's clear. Um, but it's ultimately, God, this isn't my word. This isn't me speaking. This is your word speaking to us. And we pray, Father, that um, it would be convicting and that we would be challenged. Um, but the response would not be to go away annoyed or go away offended, but to actually look at our lives and examine what does the Bible say? Um, what have you said in your word about our lives? We ask this, Father, and you